This is the, the front display window of the College Hill Bookstore in Providence, Rhode Island, the old College Hill Bookstore in Providence, Rhode Island, which is apparently no longer there. So I was actually orbiting around the College Hill Bookstore for another reason on that strange every third week of the month timetable. I was looking for the latest issue of Macworld. Yeah. I suspect other people may have had this experience. Uh, I had learned uh, from trial and error that new issues of the magazine um, devoted to all things Macintosh arrived at College Hill reliably in the third week of every month. Yes, you could subscribe, but for some reason subscri subscription copies tended to arrive a few days later, which I just couldn't tolerate. Um, and College Hill would, for whatever reason, get them first in the, in, the, in the kind of local area. And so when that time of the month rolled around, I'd organize my week around regular check-ins at College Hill to see if a shipment of Macworld goodness had arrived on their, on their magazine rack. Now this was obsessive behavior, I admit, but not entirely irrational. It was the result of a kind of imbalance, not a chemical imbalance, but an information imbalance. If you understand what I want to say today about the future of the news ecosystem, it's essential, I think, that we travel back to that holding pattern outside the College Hill bookstore, which continued unabated for another three years, by the way. If you wanted to keep up with any of this, there was just about one channel available to you as a college student in Providence, Rhode Island. You read Macworld. And even then, if you staked out the College Hill bookstore, waiting for the issues hot off the presses, you were still getting the news a month or two late, given the long lead times of a print magazine back then. Yes, if Apple had a major product announcement, or if they fired Steve Jobs, it would make it into the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal the next day. And you could occasionally steal a few nuggets of news by hanging around the university computer store. That was pretty much it. When I left college, and came to New York in the early 90s, the technology channels began to widen ever so slightly. At some point in that period, I joined CompuServe and discovered that Mac Week magazine, we went from world to the week, the month to the week, was uploading its articles every Friday night at around six, which quickly became a kind of nerd version of appointment television for me, right? Um, and like, no schedule between six and 7.30 on Friday nights, I had to be home to read all these articles from Mac Week. It's a sad, sad story. <laughs> uh, the, the information lag went from months to days. And then in 1993, Wired Magazine launched. And suddenly I had access not only to this amazing repository of technology news, but also a new kind of in-depth analysis that had never appeared in the pages of Macworld. People writing about technology as a cultural form, not just as a kind of product review. If 19-year-old Stephen could fast forward to the present day, he would no doubt be amazed by all the Apple technology, by the MacBook Airs and the very technology that just failed me. Uh, the MacBook Airs and the iPhones. Thanks, Apple. Um, but I think he would be just as amazed by the sheer volume and diversity of information about Apple available now. In the old days, it might have taken months for details from a John Scully keynote to make the College Hill bookstore. Now the lag is seconds. The traditional newspapers actually have improved and, and extended their coverage online. Think of all the stuff that David Pogue and Walt Mossberg do. And that's not even mentioning the rumor blogs, right? The metaphors we use to think about changes in the media have a lot to tell us about the particular moment we're in, right? McLuhan talked about media as an extension of our central nervous system. And we spent 40 years trying to figure out how media was rewiring our brains. The metaphor you hear now is different, more E.O. Wilson and Les McLuhan, the ecosystem. I happen to think that this is a very useful way to think about what's happening to us now. Today's media is in fact much closer to a real world ecosystem in the way it circulates information um, than it is like the old industrial top-down models of mass media. It's a much more diverse and interconnected world, a system of flows and feeds, completely different from an assembly line. That complexity is what makes it so interesting, of course, but also makes it so hard to predict about what it's going to look like in five or 10 years. So instead of starting with the future, I propose that we look to the past. And to use that ecosystem metaphor, the state of Mac News in 1987 was a barren desert. Today, you know where this is going, it is a thriving rainforest. <laughs> By almost every important standard, the state of Mac News has vastly improved since 1987. There is more volume, diversity, timeliness, and depth. 
And I think that steady transformation from desert to jungle may be the single most important trend we should be looking at when we think about the future of news. Not the future of the news industry or the print newspaper business, the future of news itself. Because there are really two worst case scenarios that we're concerned with right now. And it's, it's crucial that we distinguish between the two of them. There is panic that newspapers are going to disappear as businesses. And then there's panic that crucial information is going to disappear with them. That we're going to suffer as a culture because newspapers will no longer be able to afford to generate the information we've relied on for so many years. When you hear people fret about the future of news, they often gravitate to two key endangered species, war reporters and investigative journalists. Will the bloggers get out of their pajamas and go start a Baghdad bureau, right? <laughs> <laughs> Will they do the kind of relentless shoe leather, shoe leather detective work that made Woodward and Bernstein household names? These are genuinely important questions, and for a lot of reasons I'm optimistic about the answers to them. But you can't see the reasons for that optimism by looking at the current state of investigative journalism in the blogosphere. Because the new ecosystem of investigative journalism is in its infancy. 